Good evening and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District September 22nd board meeting. I am AESD Board President Mark Lopez. I call this meeting to order at 5 p.m. This meeting is being conducted in person and by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Para español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 575-904-0815. Cuando se le pida, presione el PIN 968-928-582 y el símbolo pound. Any member of the public has an opportunity to address the board by submitting comments by 12 p.m. on Wednesday, September 22, 2021. Online via an electronic form as outlined in the public speaker's portion of this agenda. Submissions will be read aloud during the board meeting by the board president or designee. Let's begin with the board roll call vote. Board member Dr. Paolo Magalas. Here. Board member Ryan A. Rellis will not be present this evening. Board member Juan G. Alvarez. Present. Board clerk Jackie Philbeck. Present. And board president Mark Lopez, yours truly. Item 1B, public speakers for closed session agenda items. There are no public speakers tonight. Item 2, adjournment to closed session. Is there a motion? Go ahead. <laughs> so moved. Second. Philbeck. Right. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. That's aye. a vote. Aye. Passes with all members present. We will adjourn to closed session. Elementary School District September 22nd board meeting. I am AESD Board President Mark Lopez and I call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted in person and by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para Español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 575-904-0851. Cuando se le pida, presione el PIN 968-928-582 y el símbolo pound. Let's begin with the flag salute. Dr. Downey, if you wouldn't mind leading us.
Thank you very much. That takes us to item 3B, our introductions and roll call. Beginning to my right, Dr. Paolo Magalas. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Ryan A. Rellis, board member, will not be present this evening. Juan G. Alvarez. Good evening. Jackie Philbeck, our board clerk. Good evening, everyone. I'll tell you why I'm wearing this later. All right, we will be in suspense until then. Thank you, Board Clerk Philbeck. Uh, and I'm your Board President, Mark A. Lopez. We have our Superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing. Good evening, everyone. Our Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, Dr. Mary Grace. Hello, everyone. Our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Dina Melland. Good evening. Our Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services, Jesse Chavarria. Good evening, everyone. Our Senior Director of School Safety and Operations, Tracy Golden. Good evening, everyone. Our Senior Administrative Assistant, Iris Camacho. Our Interpreters, Mary Madrigal and Alina Avila Roque. Technology Support Technician, Janice Cato. Media Services Supervisor, Brian Brooks. And our Technology Support Technician, Ben Hausman, is here on behalf of Daryl Hutchison this evening. That takes us to item 3C. Our report of closed session action, actions taken, there have been none. Item 3D is the adoption of the agenda. Our action calendar, item 9D.1, effective date September 23rd, 2021, has been amended to read effective date to be determined. Is there a motion? So moved. Second, Thank Alvarez. Thank you, Dr. Magalis and Trustee Alvarez. Any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, all those in favor, please say yes or aye. Aye. Also vote aye passes with all members present for zero. Takes us to item four, special order of business. Item four is our school reopening update. Dr. Christopher Downing, our superintendent, and Tracy Golden, our senior director of school safety and operations. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have some in-person uh, audience members this evening and it's good to see you back. So we'll begin tonight's update by letting you know that this week our district transitioned to on-site testing. Uh, before Tracy provides us with some information regarding that, we just want to inform the public and our stakeholders that key elementary school testing site will still be available in the afternoons on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday by appointment. Uh, although we've had a recent uh, decline in the number of persons seeking testing, uh, we want to continue to provide this well-needed service for our stakeholders. Tracy? Thank you, good evening. Um, we did transition this week, uh, so we had our testers go out to the school sites. Um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, they're gonna take Thursday and Friday off because of conferences. And then starting next week, we'll continue with that. So um, that's kind of getting our testers oriented to the process and also our school sites. And so they tested a variety of students and staff at all our schools this week. I also wanted to give an update on the last vaccination clinic that we had at Family Oasis on September 9th. We did um, 77 vaccinations were administered. And if you remember the last time um, we reported, the last two that we've had had around 50, so quite a bit more. So they were, we were really happy about that. And we will continue to work um, with the Orange County Healthcare Agency to offer more in the future. Finally, just wanted to give an update on the contact tracing uh, responsibilities that we have. I won't read everything on this slide, but on the left-hand side, you can see that we had site teams doing all the contact tracing, which was the administrators, the nurses, the faces, and it's quite a bit of um, contacting families, um, interviewing people, and kind of figuring out what was going on, finding out the infectious period, and then also reporting all that information to the healthcare agency. So we were able to onboard um, some contact tracers who can take a, a lot of that responsibility off of the school site so that they can uh, you know, tend to, the, I'm a, tend to all the activities that are happening at school. So the administrators now have still a couple of responsibilities that they have to do, which has to do with um, sending the, the follow-up letters after the parents have been contacted by the contact tracers, and also determining who was on campus, uh, because by law we do have to notify all our employees who were on campus if there's a positive case. But then the rest of the responsibilities the contact tracers are able to do. And that's really just our, our update. If anybody has any questions, we're, we're happy to answer anything. 
Any questions, board members? All right, hearing none. All right, well, thank you very much. Very efficient. We appreciate that. That takes us to, oh, by the way, that presentation, oh, sorry, that presentation will be posted on our district website, Board of Education page tomorrow. That takes us to item five, our news and updates. Five A's, our parent leadership group updates. There is no parent leadership group update this evening. Item 5B, association updates. There are no association updates this evening. Item 5C, our district news and updates. There will be a district news and updates item this evening. Dr. Mary Grace, our assistant superintendent of educational services. Thank you, board president Lopez. Uh, we are happy to share with you our, cur our current fall school reopening safety commercial. So go ahead, Brian or Janice. I am Dr. Chris Downing, the proud superintendent of the Anaheim Elementary School District. We are here today at Barton Elementary School with Principal Mrs. Bartoldis to highlight the successful return to full-time in-person learning. Throughout this pandemic, our Board of Education and District have placed the safety of our students and staff at the forefront as we weathered COVID-19 and the consistently high transmission rates that have been experienced here in Anaheim. Together with our staff members, we have been truly excited to return to full day instruction and safely welcome students back to our classrooms for the start of this 2021-22 school year. However, we must all continue to work together to emphasize safety and follow the protocols that have been established to keep us all safe. The purpose of this video is to take a tour at two of our schools where you will see the health and safety protocols in place that help us ensure safe in-person learning for all students every single day. Let's join Principal Bartoldis as we take a look at Barton Elementary School. Thank you, Dr. Downing, and welcome to Barton Elementary School. Today I'd like to share with you a few of the safety protocols the district follows to ensure that in-person learning is safe for all of our students. All essential visitors are screened in the office prior to coming onto campus. Visitors' temperatures are taken and they are screened using the symptom checker questions. In the classroom and indoor spaces, students are required to wear face masks. Each classroom has a supply of personal protective equipment and hand sanitizer to use as needed. Teachers, along with other staff members, promote good hand hygiene by encouraging students to wash their hands frequently. In the music room, students wear face masks and use hand sanitizer when entering and exiting the music classroom. Students who play an instrument are assigned an instrument to use for the entirety of the school year. Music instruction can also take place outside without face masks and following social distancing guidelines. All classrooms, offices, common areas, restrooms, and surfaces are sanitized daily. In addition, high touch areas are sanitized throughout the day by custodians and safety assistants. Students have access to hand washing stations throughout the campus and disposable masks are available to anyone who may need one. Now we will head over to Ponderosa Elementary to learn more about our safety protocols and our commitment to cleaning our schools. Dr. Moreno, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Welcome to Ponderosa. Today we will share with you the safety precautions AESD has in place to ensure our students and staff have a healthy, safe, and positive school environment. Our amazing custodians ensure high-touch areas and surfaces are sanitized and cleaned throughout the school day. These high-touch areas require the custodian to frequently visit throughout their scheduled day. High-touch areas are identified as the office, the restroom, the lunch tables, and handrails, just to name a few. In our classrooms, the students have access to use safety personal protective equipment as needed. Each student and family received a health kit to begin the school year. Our night custodians ensure each classroom is sanitized daily using their checklist. Our after school programs, they follow the same safety protocols as we do in the classrooms. 
This supports our AESD mission to ensure all our students and staff are safe and protected on our campuses. To talk more about our classroom safety, here's our Assistant Superintendent, Jesse Chavaria. Hello everyone, my name is Jesse Chavaria and I am the Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services. The California Department of Public Health states that the best mitigation strategy for fighting the virus causing COVID-19 is through masking, improving air filtration, and cleaning. I will focus on air filtration and cleaning. We have improved the air filtration of all schools by following the California Department of Public Health guidelines related to HVAC systems. We installed an air purifier system in every HVAC unit. Some offices and portable classrooms have a standalone HEPA air purifiers. We replace the regular HVAC filters with a four ply filter. Each of these four ply filters come with antimicrobial agents that help to purify the air. These filters get replaced every three to four months. The district's energy management system was also upgraded to allow more efficient and effective schedule to make the HVAC units run for longer times. Regarding cleaning, our custodial staff received training on frequent and effective disinfecting and cleaning of classrooms, offices, and restrooms. We created a daily cleaning and disinfecting checklist that is in every classroom. In the districts, custodians initial this checklist each day when the items are cleaned and disinfected in each room. All schools have portable hand washing stations that students and staff can use outside the classrooms. And we have placed hand sanitizer dispensers at every entry and exit to a classroom. The safety of students and staff is of the utmost importance to us. For this reason, we will continue to monitor that everything I previously mentioned is in place. Our custodians, our HVAC technicians, and all of our maintenance and operations staff are to be commended for their daily hard work in ensuring that we have effective filtration and that we have clean and disinfected classrooms, offices, and restrooms. We appreciate you joining us today for this snapshot of the many safety and health protocols our district has in place. Your school principal will keep you updated regarding any changes or new information through their regular school communication and principal chats. So thank you for watching our short commercial. We'll be putting that out with our, on our social media platforms and sharing it with our school sites beginning tomorrow. And thank you to uh, Brian Brooks and his team and helping us put it together and our four co-stars of the video. All right, thank you. And for the two who are present, the autograph line will be starting where? <laughs> After immediately following the board meeting? Okay. We'll start the queue over here on the left side of the dais. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to item six. Can I just say something? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, highlight the fact that I love that we're doing a checklist and that the custodians are the stars of that show and that they're getting highlighted. I can see their name and they're dressed in their full gear and they're out there showing us what they're doing. And that's, I appreciate that because they, they deserve to be recognized. Thank you. It's a great video, really great. And everybody looks really sharp on camera. So you guys did a great job, thank you. All right, great, thank you very much. That takes us to item six, public speakers. These are speakers on agenda or non-agenda items. There are no public speakers or no public comments this evening. Taking us to item seven, our superintendent's report. Seven A is our AESD dual language immersion program update with Maria Viegas, our director of curriculum instruction and Magali Rodriguez, our coordinator of multilingual language instruction programs. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening, school board president, uh, board members, cabinet. It's our pleasure to be here. As we prepared for tonight, I was finding myself um, above and beyond being excited because I I found that this is an opportunity to be in community with others to talk about our district. And it isn't until you have those opportunities that you realize how exciting it is. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be in person with you to talk a little bit about something that I think brings um, excitement and joy and 
um, in terms of our dual language program. So of course, we've already introduced our wonderful coordinator of multi-language programs, Magali Rodriguez. We're gonna be doing a little bit of tag team. We were both like, no, I wanna talk. No, I wanna talk. No, we had a, just cause it's such a great time. So again, I wanted to start us off with a little bit of inspiration. I, I put a quote on the, on the first slide of the presentation and gosh, now if you live a new life for every language you speak, no, if you live a new life for every language you speak, if you know only one language, you live only once. And I thought, gosh, to be able to truly be able to experience, you know, life fully, I think language and culture is the best way that we can do that for our students, for ourselves. I don't know how you feel when you travel or you go above, you go above and um, go beyond. Uh, abroad, you realize, wow, there's just a, an amazing world, and we often get that through language and culture. So I think that's one of the greatest gifts we bring through our language program. So with that inspiration, I will move on. So I'm gonna just start us off on, full, on the first slide, then I'll transition over to Magali, and then I'll come back to you guys. But just wanna start off as you know, we started planning for the school year, thinking, okay, where are we with our dual language programs? What are our goals for our program? Where do we want to ensure that we're providing that support? So some of the things right off the bat that we've identified and wanna ensure that we're doing this year is, you know, we're a growing program in our Spanish dual language program. We've um, matriculated up to second grade. We have a group, a new cadre of new teachers. We wanna make sure that they're our priority. Uh, a, a, of course, not ignoring all our teachers, but wanting to make sure they're getting the support that they need in their classrooms. And that involves both new teachers to our district as well as existing teachers in our district who have taken that leap of faith to just see um, and wanna be part of this wonderful program. So that's first and foremost. Of course, we know that the most important person leading that charge is our principals. You know, all the research, they have to be the champions of that program, the better prepared they are to be able to speak to the curriculum, understanding the language of instruction, what those minutes look like, what the content looks like. If they can speak to those things, they're gonna be able to ensure to keep their stakeholders, their parents, their students, and their community engaged in understanding the value of this program. So of course, that's, uh, our ongoing charge, it's not a one and done, but knowing it's a constant topic that needs to be addressed and integrated into any professional development we do with our administrators. And that second bullet under nurturing that school-wide culture, I think we've learned, I'm sorry, I probably need to go faster. We've learned over time that it's critical to ensure that this is part of the school-wide culture. It's not one classroom, it's not one grade level, because if you don't have that piece, then you don't have that collaboration across grade levels and across the school. And we all know that what you feel and what you know is the culture of a school when you walk on that, on that campus. So it's critical to develop this piece um, amongst our schools. And then again, we said continuing to develop the implementation of those target language materials. You know, Spanish um, is something that we've been doing now for a while, but the Korean is also a piece that we're gonna talk about tonight, and that's a, you know, it isn't as, as um, common to most of us, so it's critical that we spend that time developing that expertise in that area, and then again, the ongoing promoting of the program, both from the school site level and at the district level, because truly it's a collaboration. Of course, we want, again, the principals to lead the charge and be in charge of, of their programs, but we know it's a collaboration and we share in that support with school sites. Okay, so I will. All right, good evening, everybody. So we're gonna be looking at briefly talking about the language of instruction. It's always grounded in what we call the Cadillac model of a dual language program, which is what we have um, in line with the guiding principles, and Maria touched on one of the three pillars, which was culture, but it's really looking at all three pillars of the guiding principles of a dual language program. And so, just as a reminder, we operate from the best possible um, lens or outlet, which would be the 90-10 model. So you see here that reflected, and um, specifically highlighting how uh, the majority of our classrooms right now are within that second grade, we're talking about the expansion, with three of our schools fully matriculated all the way through. So again, um, TK and kindergarten, we have 90% of instruction in Spanish. So really the entirety of the day with the exception of very intentional language development in English happening with that 10%. So it's an additive program, meaning we're really highlighting the assets of the students are bringing and we're adding that second language very intentionally across the board. And then we reach fourth, fifth and sixth eventually, which is a 50-50 per day. And again, that's actually something that's very, um, 
it's very relevant, but something that we've done very well, and we actually were first to the game in doing it, understanding that they need to experience that language on a daily basis, not wait until later to reach that. Similarly, we have our Korean program, which is an 80-20 model, very similar to a 90-10, with the exception that in kindergarten, we added that extra 10%, if you will, of English, and that was very um, intentional as well, with um, not only with resources, but really providing our students. A lot of our students, um, it is a very, I invite you to visit those classrooms, the, the Korean classrooms, because you'll see the variety, really the, our, our community really represented in, in, within that classroom. And so with that, we understood that some of our students were coming with some Spanish already from the home, as long as with other languages. So that's where we added that intentional extra 10%, if you will, of English instruction as well. And so we have the 80-20, again, similarly um, added a program across, across the board. Okay, so we're, when we're talking about our expansion, um, where we stand right now, we happily serve 2,680 students of our ASD community within our dual language programs. We have 121 DLI teachers and 121 DLI classrooms with those teachers spearheading really in the front lines as we, as we think, right? And so um, our expansion, just to highlight, um, bringing us full circle from the last board meeting, we're talking about 16 new second grade teachers that were added, right? Um, and some of them were existing teachers in our English um, instruction that moved over to DLI, and we have um, new ones as well that have been hired, and um, just to say some of them, a lot of them were actually seasoned teachers that have chosen to come from existing DLI programs, I won't say where, but um, they're coming to teach with us because we are amazing, right? And then we have a, one new third grade um, DLI class, one new fourth grade, two new fifth grade, and one new sixth grade, and this also includes our Korean. It's just moving forward, assume that it's, you know, we're, we're making that connection. So um, DLA classroom snapshot. So if you were at a, in a classroom, what is it that you would find in every dual language classroom? And I, I just want to be clear that within our classroom setting, their, our teachers are receiving the same professional development. They're receiving everything that they need in terms of materials and resources um, with the highlight of instructional assistants that do support our TK through first grade classrooms. They share an instructional assistant. We have that high quality curriculum materials in both target, a target language and English English instruction as well. Um, and we really do take pride in the curriculum that we're bringing forth. Um, we don't settle for, let's say, sometimes a limited curriculum that comes with our adopted materials, but we do really take it above and beyond ensuring that they have access to language standards, um, academic uh, language um, lessons that we're creating from scratch for our teachers and essentially, obviously, our students. Um, site curriculum coach. So every school has a curriculum coach and I wanted to highlight there that we have been, we added what we call the a DLI dish to every coach meeting that we have. And there's like those 10, 15 minute snippets of every coach meeting where we're bringing to light DLI concepts, right? So it doesn't matter if they're monolingual or bilingual, they're able to support our teachers just the same. Um, and we're, we're infusing that on, a day, on um, every coach meeting on how is it that they can do that and still support our teachers. And we have a very unique to us, again, to Anaheim, we have a district DLI TOSA, which supports directly our, our not only our administrators, but our teachers, our parents. So um, it's Alyssa Sanchez, so we're very proud to have her on board, and she's now already building relationships. We've gone out already to meet with principals at school sites, um, building that relationship and really hearing them, what is it that they need from us to support, and then um, in turn support the teachers and students as well. And then professional development, which highlights in its own slide, um, but this is where a lot of our work is done. We really are here for the educators and the students. And so um, we provided professional development specific for new teachers. You heard the amount of um, new teachers that we onboarded, but we also continue the work with existing teachers as well. So it's really that differentiated PD. Um, we offered iStation and Vista Higher Learning, which is the publisher for our Spanish language development. We hired the launching, the onboarding, and um, some of them even asked to, our existing teacher asked, hey, can we join that PD? Sure, why not, right? If that's what they felt they needed, that extra support. And then we have Google Meet. So we have just Google Meet that are open, that you tell us what you need. Of course, in the background, we always have something prepared just in case, right? And sometimes they don't know what they're looking for. Um, but those have been also very successful. They can just pop in and out, no stress, just um, answer questions or walk them through. How do I add a student to my class? So those in the moment things that sometimes come up that can hinder, right, or keep you from just applying that instruction. And we also surveyed the teachers. So um, re recently, um, we had a full day of planning collaboration for our teachers. And to end, 
um, I provided a, a Google survey where I was asking them to tell us what are some ideas, what is it that you still need for support, and that, that will then frame the support that we provide moving forward. And some of the results, just to name a few, was that cross-linguistic transference, which speaks to our non-transferable standards. We call the blue standards in Spanish, and then those are, um, and again, not, not forgetting our Korean friends as well, right? What is it that they need? And again, cross-linguistic transference, it's across the board in general. It doesn't matter the language. It applies. And so framing now moving forward um, that PD as well. And so language development in DLI, that's been a big highlight. Um, we're talking about academic discourse. We're talking about oral language. It's really what, what's that language development? And very intentionally, it doesn't have a language in front of language development because you're developing a language regardless of what that language is. So we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into our Korean dual language program. Um, so now we're in our third year of our Korean dual language program. You know, I think we're all very proud that it's, you know, that the first program here in Orange County, which, um, I, I, you know, again, these are celebrations along the way that we need to be reminded, especially when things are, you know, sometimes um, maybe get forgotten along the way. But what we want to share with you is just a, a little deeper dive of what does it look like to have a full functioning Korean dual language program here in Anaheim Elementary. And we're really proud of this work. And we want to just have you walk away with the sense of, wow, this is a comprehensive um, collaboration across multiple departments and partners, and I'm gonna kinda just go through some of those pieces. So the first piece I wanted to start off with here is what we've coined our Korean development team, our partners. Um, you know, as we started that, the journey of looking at adding Korean, um, we, there was a lot of uh, work that went beforehand, finding those, those partners that were gonna guide us, give us that insight so we could truly identify what we thought at the time would be curriculum that we could bring into our Korean program. What we, what we discovered quickly is there really wasn't existing curriculum and what we like to do in education, there was an opportunity and a great opportunity to truly make this our own and get it at the level that we wanted here based on our Anaheim Elementary standards. So we partnered through research, through, through um, you know, uh, referrals and, you know, connections from other districts, and we were able to land on what we think is a, quite an exceptional group of experts in Asian language and cultures. Um, it's a group of four individuals. We call them, again, the, the team, the Korean development team. So the, some of the background of these experts include, uh, there, two of them are professors, one at Cal State Long Beach, one at um, UCLA, one is an expert video specialist that's also a language learner in Korean who's supporting us with their Korean uh, language development videos that really take that perspective of specifically learning Korean language. Um, and then some of the things that we wanna highlight there, of course, um, aside from the expert that we're getting in these individuals is that we really have expected that they align this curriculum to you know a high level caliber of what we have in place for all students so they've they've mirrored what we're doing in terms of Korean units 10 units for students where the, they're creating these experts are creating authentic short text and long text for students to engage in these are we've curated basically our own curriculum and maybe you know if we ever want to sell it there's a note for <laughs> Jesse, make some money. No, no. I mean, it truly is authentically owned by our district that you can't find anywhere else. And again, that's something to be proud of and um, that we're certainly proud of in terms of what children, what's being put in front of children. So again, it's authentic text. And the beauty of this text is that, as you can see there, we've outlined a little bit of the process. They're creating these texts and then um, they're ensuring that it's culturally and linguistically relevant today. So what they do is in creating the stories and they're sending it back to uh, their partner who actually is in Korea and saying, hey, now align some current images of what's current in Korea in terms of the, the culture, the mores, what, what, is, what do we need to ensure is part of the text? And then it gets sent back to us. Um, and then of course we're ensuring it's aligned with the state standards and everything else, but it's just such there, there's such depth there that you kind of walk away going, wow, this is pretty awesome. So, um, and it, it's a process. I want to just, uh, uh, again, emphasize it's a process and um, we feel proud by standing by what kids are getting in front of them. So again, once it's approved, we bring it back and then we want to take you to step two, which then 
just to really highlight the process that happens here in our district. So we get this text, and then we have a wonderful, we could not do this without you know, what we included and through the data department, they hired a translator interpreter, Joy, um, who spends eight hours every day um, translating plus additional hours just on the Korean program. So, um, and part of that work, what she brings back to us, is she brings this text back to us, helps translate it for us because it's, I, I think it's no secret, and none of us are fluent Korean speakers, and we don't want to not do right by the language, but in order to then be able to uh, look at the, at the text that's been provided, and again, vet it out with the standards here, we have to get it translated. So it's an elaborate process of then um, being able to have it, Joy translates it for us, we again look at it, we align, half of my department works on writing, writing prompts, that also are aligned, looking at the language standards that can just, again, are ensured that we're in lining with what the standards and the rigor of the standards are asking for. Okay, that's just some of the revising of the curriculum. Then there's the translating of the curriculum, which I already alluded to, which Joy helps with. Then we go into also the creation of, of a lot of this curriculum, because though we have these great experts, they're not creating everything. And again, Joy is a big part of that as well. You know, and, and, and it, it includes our data, again, with the assessments um, and also the report cards and the translation of that. And then we go into our warehouse, which they're also amazing, the delivery, the printing, the print shop. It's just such a, and then fiscal, of course, when we're sending our POs, please order it to Korea. Yes, yeah, send it to Korea. You know, this is what we're buying. It's, you know, in some cases, some of these. So it's, it's quite a collaboration. And we've learned a lot along the way. Um, which I think has just made us stronger in terms of implementing what we think are high quality language programs for our students. And here, just to again punctuate like just some of these examples of, of some of the translation, we just kind of listed some of those pieces. I'm not gonna go through them, but we just kind of bulleted what does that look like to really just capture the essence of the work again, because we are proud of it, and, and we want to showcase that it's a true collaboration and it falls across all these areas when we're talking about putting forth high quality curriculum. Before we leave this area, um, I do also want to continue to highlight that the um, foundation for uh, Korean language and culture are also side by side with us, even to, to this day. <laughs> Um, they continue to support us fiscally, as well as our teachers attend um, many of their professional development. Recently, it's been online, but you know, as we go back to in person, um, they're continuing to support us because it's important for the Korean people to keep their heritage language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we still have them as a partner and. Oftentimes we'll pick up the phone when we're looking for something or the principal needs support with something. So still very um, appreciative of that relationship. As Net, well. Thank you, Dr. Rice. I'd be remiss too if I didn't mention part of the team is absolutely the principal, Dr. Song, at her own school with her teachers. Part of this process includes ongoing conversations with her and her teachers to, to make those adjustments to better understand what more they need, what's not transferring in terms of practice, and again, just doing the best we can and just being responsive to that. So um, another important piece of this team. And finally, I'm gonna leave you just with a little bit of a food for thought here. You know, part of our district I know is that we're proud of always being innovative, thinking ahead, how are we pre preparing our kids to be you know, college and career ready, but global ready as well in terms of what we're equipping them with, what skills, what they need. And I know part of our pledge, part of our LCAP goals is always thinking about how are we culturally and linguistically responding and preparing students um, for what awaits them. So, you know, when we started exploring prior to the pandemic, hey, what would be some future languages? We value this, we know what it, what it, brings to children in terms of their learning and also the social cultural competence pieces. Um, we started to do some exploration, of course, with our Emergent Bilingual Council. This is a group of stakeholders that's made of teachers. Um, uh, you have administrators, you have parents, you have classified personnel, just kind of a, a, a slice of different representatives to 
look at and talk about uh, different programs that would support language acquisition and how we address that. And part of that discussion was if we looked at future languages based on global recommendations, based on local data, based on what we want to provide kids as part of our vision and mission, what, what do we want to offer? So part of that recommendation at that time was Mandarin as a potential next language. And what I just coupled there on the right side is also that kind of aligns with what you are reading on all current research. Of course, it's always English, Spanish, which check, check, we're doing those. And naturally, um, the recommendations there is you consider, I listed the Mandarin, Spanish is already something we have, German and Arabic. Um, also, you consider some of those variables that you consider in terms of top world languages, of course, the number of speakers, you know, geographic regions, versatility, usability, and just implications for future career opportunities. So we wanted to just share that update, that that was something that was brought to the table. It was going to be a future next steps exploration, something that if the board feels and the cabinet feels that we want to uh, continue to explore future languages, I just want to, to remind all of us that the research says it takes about one to two years to fully research, prepare, and, and put out a new dual language program, even though We've proven to, to, to do what I think is a, a pretty good job. Um, I, I, you know, we, we want to ensure we give our families and students the time for us to prepare and do it right, of course, as we have been doing. So I think we have one slide and we can either answer and I'll, and I'll just turn it to Megali or we can do questions. I, I saw board member McCullough had a question or two. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, on that note, I'm slacking. I need to learn another language like ASAP, right? <laughs> All right, just um, closure. Um, I wanna leave you with a celebration slide. Um, I will have the honor of presenting the, at this year's California School Boards Association. And I know Mr. Alvarez will be joining. He'll be our shining star there representing um, AESD. And really, um, we are gonna be partnering with Anaheim Union High School District and Californians together. Uh, highlighting our exemplary structures that we have in place, um, starting with us foundationally um, and elementary, and then how we have been able to do what we do, being that we're only elementary. Um, people tend to really almost forget. A lot of the times they assume we're unified because of all the systems that we have in place. So it is um, a really good opportunity for us to show the partnership that we have able to create with our sister district. So on December 2nd, we will be um, honored there and celebrating um, what a great accomplishment you've done collectively as a school district. Okay, thank you. I always go first. Uh, does any of my other colleagues <laughs> wanna ask questions? I have a lot. <laughs> okay, well first and foremost, I'll start with something positive. Every single time you come here and present us with updates, there's always, always an amazing layer of accomplishments especially during the current day pandemic, uh, we're still able to do so many amazing things with our dual language immersion program. Uh, looking at the data, <clears throat> incredibly uh, proud and happy of how much, of it, how much it's grown. Please thank the team, I'm so happy. But not only has it just grown, it has been organic. It was an authentic, organic, community responsive process versus other districts who just, oh, okay, check the box, check the box, check the box. You're doing it organically. It is hard, it is difficult, but that is the beauty and nature of the curriculum that y'all have created in collaboration with uh, experts in the university. So I give you so much kudos to the entire team. So proud every time you come up here. Uh, a few questions though, uh, just out of curiosity. Um, well, uh, one more comment before. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I've talked to some of the trustees at uh, AUHSD, and I know that in the west side of Anaheim, because my area is uh, trustee area three, part of the westernmost part of Anaheim, and uh, I know in the westernmost part of Anaheim, we do have a little area known as Little Arabia, which unfortunately the city council wouldn't uh, recognize as a part of Anaheim, but in the end of the day, I'm super supportive of Arabic. Um, I know AUHSD is looking into possibly having that as a pathway. So I don't know, I just wanna throw those uh, two cents in there about my support in that, um, if you choose the West Side School. <laughs> so I, I trust you all in that. Uh, just know that I'm supportive of it. Uh, the only question I do have is because I am, 
I am happy that, you know, we have teachers that want to be here, that we've had some seasoned vets that are coming into our sites because they want to come. I love that. But uh, I'm just curious with regards to our, the current Book Become program. I know we started that a couple years ago. The current teachers who are interested in being DLI teachers. We had been awaiting confirmation from the state because okay. that was part of a grant that ah. uh, AESD, AUHSD, and Westminster were partnered with Cal State Fullerton. And um, just recently today, just Mr. Chavari and I were talking about it um, and looking at some of the available funds that we do have, whether that's our uh, Title III funds for in, uh, language programs or some of the uh, professional development funds we've recently received, yes. if we could partner again with Cal State Fullerton because okay. there still was an interest of teachers and we're very proud that um, of the participants in that program, AESD always had the most nice. interest and yep. participation. <laughs> nice. And it was well-rounded. We had classified, certificated, and administrators that participated. So um, nice. we're going to reach out to our friends at Cal State Fortune and see if we can't put something together to complete during the school year okay. and be in preparation for next year because we know we at least need 16 third grade teachers yeah. at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah. again, great job. Always impressed and very proud when y'all come up here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for everything you do for our students and our families. Uh, I'm just really excited about uh, what you spoke about today with the Korean uh, cur uh, language development curriculum that we're creating. It's really cool to see that you're pr essentially you're creating a model for how any district can create a program in any language, right? Yeah. So again, we're on the for forefront, we're the model, we're the ones who are the experts, and it's just really clear that we figure out what to do and we do it the best we can and it's for the kids, for the families, and we just move forward with it. So I really do appreciate everyone involved, all the partnerships that have been built to bring that Korean language development curriculum to life. And um, I'm sure the families are super thankful as well. Like you were saying, Dr. Grace, that yeah, for a lot of different cultural uh, uh, experiences, our families want to keep the language as part of their experience, right? And to be able to offer now a language that's new to it, a, a different family from a different culture, it makes me really kind of like see hope and light <laughs> in what we do as educators here, right? Because yeah. we're spreading language and multiple languages throughout our district. So I, it really makes me happy mm -hmm. to know that we're doing a good job with that. Uh, with regards to our new teachers, I just wanna make sure that they're getting as much support as we can with regards to being ready to teach and ha feeling like they're comfortable with the materials that they're getting, uh, making sure that if there's support they need, that there's avenues for that support. Uh, specifically, I know that uh, many of our newer sites have uh, one teacher per grade level at the site, so it's really hard to get grade level support. And so I just wanted to know if you could speak on if there's anything in place that we are continuing to put in place to ensure that teachers that have only one that they're the only person with that grade level on their site can reach out to other teachers at that grade level or do they reach out to you or is, can you explain if we're doing anything like that so we could, I just wanna make sure they're getting support. Yeah, I, I can definitely speak to that. So I know um, we've been really busy in meeting with teachers on demand. And I, and that's a, that was important for me to set up because like I said, as a former DLI teacher, a lot of the times you needed it in the moment, right? And so um, I know our DLI Tosa and myself, we've been able to communicate with the teachers. Like I mentioned on demand, we'll send them a Google Meet, they jump. And that's been one of the great takeaways actually from the pandemic, if I must say, that we're able, we have that flexibility to bring it to them accessible. Um, there's been some that have rather met in person and we've done that, of course, practicing all social distancing. Um, we've been able to meet with them as well. Um, and they also, we provided a, a menu of what are some items that are like almost triage for them, right? So again, um, looking at these are the elements that you need right now, how comfortable are you? Yeah, can you show me how to do this or how to do that, how to do that? And um, if I may share an anecdote, we had two um, veteran teachers that came from, and I know I mentioned already that came from a different district, but it was really heartfelt because they, they met with us gearing up. They hadn't even stepped in the first day of school yet, but we provided um, a new DLI teacher orientation where they came 
or workshop, we call them workshops, um, and they spent the day with us, and then they had that collaboration day, and, and although their head was like, poof, right, with so much information, and almost a lot of support, they did share this, like, we've never had this before, and they've been teaching for 10 plus years. They said that the level of support, um, I get goosebumps, right, because the level of support that you're providing, not only in the moment support, but the, um, all the resources that they have, click here, go here, and sometimes a lot in the moment is a lot, but it, they can come back to it, and so she, they, they both stopped me and stayed after and said, I just can't believe the amount of resources that are available and the amount of support that, again, I'm here, uh, DLI Tosa, but we also have an entire ed services division that comes instantly. Like they really do, we really do collaborate and meet. So um, in that regard, that's one of the items that I felt, and I know I shared it with Maria because it made, it made a huge impact on me that it validates all of the work that we're doing because again, we're here for them. I was just going to add that um, I, I love the question about different avenues because I think it's different ways to reach different people. They, they each respond to the information differently. But one of the things that we have been exploring and we have been setting, you know, with technology comes great opportunities. And this idea to when you're a single strand to be able to even meet virtually to have that connection is certainly something that we're looking at leveraging because you don't. Again, I started by saying just being in person, that's invaluable, but there's also value in being able to connect virtually that can then lend itself to other opportunities. So we're absolutely optimizing our virtual platforms to see how we could create collaborations, and those being more after school being optional so people can have just avenues and platforms to collaborate. But I, I think it's a great question, so thank you for that. Also, uh, Dina Mellon pointed out that they all are in the induction, our, most of our new teachers are in the induction program, so they meet regularly together in that setting, along with their support providers who are also in the program. That's great, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so I like the idea of your, what you're saying, just creating the avenue, saying, okay, here's, here's the grouping of that teaches second grade, uh, here are some opportunities for you to jump in together without the district there, like you just jump in and you ask each other questions, you share curriculum, you share ideas, because even, even more veteran teachers can uh, pick up things from newer teachers and vice versa, right? So just having this community to be able to connect to is invaluable, right? Yeah. The best resources come from other teachers typically, right? So I, I would like to see that please happen. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, when we start working, I know it'll happen, when we start working into developing what other language we bring in to the program, I just want to make sure that we are, we're working in some avenues for community input, right? Because it's also important that like, we could look at the research, we can look at business and what they're looking for with regards to language, but it'd also be really uh, a great opportunity to survey our families in the area in different pockets of our district to see what languages they would like us to help teach uh, to their children as well. So just to keep, in, keep that in mind, please. Thank you, appreciate all your help. I love that, I, especially our preschool families, I've thought about that. They're the perfect, like survey them so they stay with us, so absolutely. Well, that's what I was actually gonna address is how are we going to decide, you know, and it, what kind of input are we gonna have? So thank you for that question because um, that answers it. And my other questions were answered because the presentation was so great. And I just, so I'll just say thank you for all your hard work. Um, it definitely shows and you make us proud. Thank you. All right, thank you for spending part of your evening with us to give us that valuable update. We appreciate it. Always good news to hear from you. Mr. Okay. President, real yeah. quick, uh, I'm curious about the Tagalog language. I know oh. that we do have a population of Filipino Americans within our district, so just question mark in the future. Oh, I'll thank you, Trustee Alvarez. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. President. All right, just food for thought, right? Just to <laughs> consider that in our future languages. All right, very subtle. Thank you, uh, Dr. Magalas, we appreciate that. Uh, and if we think of any additional questions, this presentation will be posted on the district website, Board of Education page tomorrow. So, all right, thank you very much, thank ladies. You guys. Good evening. That takes us to item eight, our consent calendar. Items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are acted on by the board in one motion. There's no discussion on these items unless a member of the board, staff, or the public requests specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. Are there any items to be pulled at this time? Dr. McCollis? Nope. Uh, Trustee Alvarez? No item. Board Clerk Philbeck? Yes, I, may, I need to pull item B2, B Educational Services. Item two. Okay. It's on page four. Okay. Please. All right. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the following consent calendar items with the exception of item 8B.2 which was pulled and will be voted on separately. Is there a motion? 
So moved. Moved by Dr. McAllis. Second, Phil Beck. All right, seconded by Board Clerk Phil Beck. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Also vote aye, passes with all members present, four zero, and that takes us to item 8B.2, educational services. It is recommended the Board of Education approve an agreement between this district and the Children and Families Commission of Orange County, 1505 East 17th Street, Suite 230, Santa Ana, California, 92705, to accept a grant for $100,000 in order to in order for engaged neighborhood services to facilitate the creation and implementation of an integrated, comprehensive, and collaborative system of information and services to enhance optimal early childhood development effective July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McGallis. Second. And seconded. Any discussion? I just pulled the item because I am a commissioner uh, for the Children's and Families Commission of Orange County. This is a this is great, and I know there's no cost to the district, but in keeping with um, what I generally do, I will abstain from the item, but thrilled about it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Board Clerk Philbeck. Uh, there has been a motion and a second. We'll take a vote. I don't believe there needs to be roll call. All right. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Vote aye. aye. Any abstentions? Abstain. All right. That passes 301 and takes us to item 9A on our action calendar. Superintendent's office is recommended to the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021 to 22 07, declaring the week of October 10th through October 16th, 2021 as week of the school administrator throughout the Anaheim Elementary School District. So moved. Second, Alvarez. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, I just want a quick comment, you know, to all the administrators. I know this last current pandemic has just been such a very difficult time, not just for our teachers, classified all employees, but administrators have been very creative and, uh, you know, in making decisions and, uh, you know, helping the families in our community. So I just want to thank those administrators early in advance. Thank you. Yeah, not only that, but also they're the main resource to getting all the information from the district office to the families. And it's really evident that we're doing a great job in passing along messages and protocols and things like that. So. Yeah, uh, very irrelevant. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor? Please say aye. 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 So vote aye passes 4-0. Item 9A2. It is recommended to the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021 to 22-08, designating October 25th through October 29th, 2021 as Red Ribbon Week throughout the Anaheim Elementary School District. Is there a motion? So moved, Phil Beck. Second, Albert. Motion is second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Also vote aye, passes 4-0. Item 9A3, it is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021 to 22-09, declaring October 25th, 2021 is Larry Itilong Day throughout the Anaheim Elementary School District. Is there a motion? So moved. Second, Alvarez. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, I just want to quickly say, sh uh, share them. So grateful that uh, you know our district has been honoring this great day a great Filipino American leader that fought alongside Cesar Chavez uh, for, you know, basic rights for the uh, the great growers of Delano County, uh, and uh, I'm just very appreciative of that. A lot of districts don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's so many labor leaders, uh, or just leaders in general, that don't get the kudos and credit uh, with all the hard work that they've done. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magas, and thank you for the uh, assist with the pronunciation earlier. Appreciate that. Although I may have butchered it anyway. All right, thank you very much. There's a motion, well, between that and Red Ribbon Week, that was a tongue twister. Uh, there's been a motion and a second. All in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 So we'll aye, passes 4-0. Item 9B, Educational Services. It is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021 to 22-11, designating the month of October 2021 as National Bullying Prevention Month throughout the Anaheim Elementary School District. So moved, Alvarez. Second, Phil Beck. Okay. Motion a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 So vote aye. Passes 4-0. Item 9C, our SELPA. There are no items. Item 9D, human resources. Number, uh, item number one, it is recommended the Board of Education approve the appointment of applicant number 09222021-01 to the position of coordinator facilities planning and construction effective date to be determined. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. Second, Philbeck. And there's a second. Any discussion? 
We'll go ahead and vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Also vote aye. Passes 4-0. Item 9E, Administrative Services. Item 1 is, it is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021-22-10, to acknowledging custodial staff for their hard work, dedication, and daily support for our students and declaring October 1st, 2021 as Custodial Workers Appreciation Day throughout the Anaheim Elementary School District. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Trustee Al Alvarez. Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Board Clerk Philbeck. Any discussion on this? Uh, just a quick comment. It's incredibly grateful for our custodial staff, uh, especially during the current pandemic. Uh, they've had to go above and beyond their duties. So with that, I'm incredibly proud of all of you. Uh, I know our uh, full staff couldn't do uh, the work that they do without our custodians. So thank you so much. I will definitely pass this. A vote yes on this. Thank you, Dr. Magalis. Uh, any other discussion? Just, okay. to, just to say that I also appreciate um, our custodial workers so much. And when I go out to the schools, even today, you know, biggest, brightest smiles, so friendly, just a joy to, you know, talk to. And they're just always working so hard, always busy. And, you know, we definitely appreciate them very much. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Also vote aye, passes 4 0. And running the risk of going sideways with our human resources department, which I would never want to do. Uh, Ms. Melland, I skipped on item 9D. She had an announcement for us. I do. Thank you very much. Congratulations go out to Mr. Alexander King. Mr. King currently serves Fullerton Joint Union High School District as their constructions project manager, where he is involved in projects such as the district-wide solar project, Buena Park and Sunny Hills High School classroom renovations, and the renovation of the Fullerton Auditorium. We welcome Mr. King to AESD. Congratulations. Thank you, Ms. Mellon. That takes us to item 10, our board discussion. This is the board member activities related to school business, beginning with Dr. McAllis. Thank you, board president. At this time, I have nothing to report. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Alvarez. Just real quick, uh, I was able to attend the LCAP meeting on September 15th, always well organized, always. Uh, soliciting input from all our stakeholders, which is awesome to see every time. So thank you for all of you who work on that. And then uh, I joined, I was able to join some PTAs, not all of them. <laughs> I, I joined all of mine, Laura, uh, Henry, Gower, Marshall, and then my son's school, man. Um, so I'm hoping I can add two more of those, but we'll get it, we'll get it going. So that's my report. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the update. Uh, Trustee Alvarez, I've been slacking on that. Uh, Board Clerk Philbeck. I attended an Orange County School Board Association seminar at the uh, Department of Education, um, and it was really informative. It was on, uh, it was a Sacramento update for budget and legislative, and there are lots of bills out there, so we discussed, uh, we had opening, we talked about schools opening and keeping safe, um, our state revenues, the extended Brown Act, Act flexibilities, and um, there's lots of bills sitting with the governor now. Some have been placed, others have been placed in active files or committee. And I just wanted to give you what is, was pointed out to us for on the horizon for 2022, what's likely to be hot topics, ongoing health and safety issues for COVID-19, um, education funding and declining enrollment, special education, improving outcomes, addressing funding and accountability, student mental wellness and behavioral health, early childhood education, California transitional kindergarten and federal push for universal pre-K and teacher and staff recruitment and retention. A lot of important topics that are gonna be coming up and we're gonna be dealing with in 2022. Also my um, Orange County delegate CSBA discussion meeting a lot is focusing, of course, on COVID. There's problems in districts. You know, we're all kind of going through the uh, requirements that the state's requiring and the masking and the vaccines. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion. It's all out there and ha being handled in different ways. I'm happy to say I was able to give a very positive report for our district because we really have, um, I think, our, our leaders in this area and thanks to our uh, staff and cabinet and, and superintendent, you know, we're just, we're doing really well. I was very happy to, when I heard all of the problems that other districts are having that 
those are not problems that we're having that we're, uh, you know, optimistically speaking, we've got it under control, we're keeping it under control. And I'm just really proud of our, our district for that. I almost felt a little bad saying, well, sorry y'all are <laughs> having such a tough time, but you know, we're, we're, we're doing okay. Um, so um, that was very, also very informative. These meetings are important. Uh, not only do I serve as a delegate for Region 15, it's, I have found over the past few years, it's just extremely important for us as um, delegates and districts to get together and hear what everybody's going through, what they're doing, how we're all handling some of the same problems, how some are handling different problems, and of course there's different grade levels and everything, so I've learned a lot. Uh, chalk webinar, those are always informative, and I'll just give you um, kind of what the, the key takeaways were, what we also discussed, vaccine updates, there's always that, adult and under 12. Uh, manufacturer trials are currently underway for the six year to 11 year olds. Boosters, possible in the fall, but subject to FDA study. We discussed where and how to get tested and Chalk has a lot of valuable resources for parents with help uh, for questions and guidelines. So the key takeaways were that COVID is obviously still circulating, although showing promising trends locally. Uh, monitoring the variants. And uh, what was interesting is, I'm not sure everybody knows this, but the variants are categorized of interest, of concern, of high consequence. Uh, Delta is a variant, variant of concern. The new variant is categorized as of interest. And as of a few days ago, there were no variants um, of high consequence in the United States. Now that was from a few days ago, we know things change but hopefully we'll keep going in that trend that you know we're, we're getting better. And then a couple of fun things. I am wearing this lei because today was Spirit Day at Edison, and I stopped by to see all of them in their Hawaiian uh, clothes and everything. It was just so fun, and Principal Nichols bestowed this lei on me, so I said I would wear it tonight to give them a shout out, and they're just doing a great job there. And also then I stopped by Addison, I'm sorry, Madison, I know someone named Madison, um, to Senator Newman had his office out there to give out ice creams to all of the students. And you know, even for such a hot day, I can tell you there's not a lot more fun than giving ice cream to kids on a really hot day. They were just so excited and a shout out to Councilman, uh, Valencia, who was also there helping in it. That was just a really fun day. I joined the PTAs for Edison, Westmont, Price, Franklin, and I tried for man, but I was having some trouble, so Mr. Alvarez is gonna help me with that. I had a little trouble with the site, couldn't quite do it. So man, uh, you're on my radar. I'll get to you this evening. And that's it, thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Board Clerk Philbeck. Uh, just a couple of things for me. I also uh, attended the LCAP meeting on the 15th, uh, along with Trustee Alvarez. I will say there were a lot of, there was a lot of great input, I think, from all the different stakeholders we had uh, who attended uh, from a variety of backgrounds. I think very valuable perspectives. Uh, doesn't always mean that we'll get 100% of what we're requesting, but it's always good to hear uh, the different voices. And I do wanna commend our superintendent and staff uh, for that inclusivity uh, because a lot of uh, attendees uh, might not, as I mentioned and alluded to, get 100% of what they're asking for, but no one could walk away from any of these meetings and, and say they didn't get an opportunity to at least voice their concerns, their requests, to have something considered uh, because there were a multitude of, of opportunities. I think throughout the entire presentation, uh, Dr. Downing had both in the chat and uh, using a microphone the opportunity for anyone and everyone to share what they would like to see, what their priorities are, um, and so I appreciate that. Uh, and I wanna commend you and your staff for uh, making that, that transparency, that accountability component that's there that we were taking note of everything that um, was suggested and uh, requested. So I appreciate that. 
Uh, the same uh, occurred the following day. I was at the budget committee, uh, or not at, but I tuned in. Um, I did have some of my own uh, parent phone calls and emails, so I was uh, there for about the second half. I was able to really listen in, and it, the same uh, inclusivity and transparency with all of our stakeholders. I appreciate that. Uh, those are the only two items that I had. I did have an announcement for this Saturday which was brought to us, uh, brought to me and my attention by our absent board member this evening, uh, Trustee Rellis. Uh, he did wanna make sure that everyone is aware this Saturday from 8 to 2, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, this is September 25th. There is a free COVID vaccine um, opportunity at Anaheim High School uh, where Anaheim Union is partnering with our Orange County Health Department, health ca uh, healthcare agency. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with where that is, it's 811 West Lincoln Avenue. Uh, there are free first and second doses that would be available. So I just wanted to make that announcement for the public. Those of us who are still tuning in on YouTube, uh, thank you for your time on that. Uh, we will move to item 11, our future agenda items, starting with, we'll start with this way, this time we'll go with uh, board clerk Philbeck. No items, thank you. Right. Just want to mix it up a little bit. Trustee Alvarez? No items. All right, and Dr. McAuliffe. All right, I have no items either. That will take us to item 12, our adjournment. Our next regular board meeting will be on Wednesday, October 13th. I adjourn this meeting at 7.37 p.m. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everyone.